I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I'm 82 years old. I go to work every day. If I could work 24 hours a day, if I didn't need sleep, I would work 24 hours a day. If you didn't pay me a nickel, I would work just as hard I love what I'm doing. I'm having the time of my life. It's going to be hard for your listeners to say this guy's not full of shit. It should never be about the money. It should always be about the accomplishment. Okay? Give a businessman a challenge with an opportunity to succeed, profit. That's a horrible word, but to make a profit, he'll figure it out. His capitalism. We have 400,000 associates at Depot today. We have 3,000 people working for the company today. 3,000. We started out pushing carts in from the parking lot. Out of high school, 18 years old. Out of multi-millionaires. Capitalism works. It works, and it works well. You talk so much about how your main successes came from investing in good people. Not only my main successes, all my successes. All, all your successes. People don't understand how valuable a lesson that is. Like, oh. one bad person could ruin a multi-billion dollar company and has on many occasions. But if you have a team of good people around you, billions of value could be created. The average home people store today does something like $40 billion a year in business. But the secret weapon always was and always will be those kids that put the aprons on every morning. That's the secret weapon. They understand the goal is not to sell something to somebody. The goal is to make somebody happy and satisfied that they came into the store. I'm doing a special intro for this one because it's kind of funny. We started recording the podcast before the podcast started. And so my, my guest today is Ken Langone. Forbes estimates his net worth at about three and a half billion dollars. He started Home Depot, among other many, many multi-billion dollar companies. Home Depot is the biggest, just a, a mega company that we've all been to. He's such a smart guy. He wrote a book. Where we talk about the book in the podcast. It's called I Love Capitalism. But in this kind of beginning preamble part of the podcast, we didn't know we were being recorded. And he's, I felt like like I was up against yoda bending my mind with the force like he was interrogating me about all the aspects of running a small business like a bar or a comedy club because we're doing the podcast in the upstairs of a comedy club and 
I felt like I was being interrogated by the master. And then, of course, we start the podcast. So I learned so many lessons. Podcast is, 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 was a fun one to do. And thanks to Ken Langone. And, you know, another thing, I don't know, there's so many, I, just, I was just talking to the producer of the podcast, like there's so many directions to go. And it's, it's not a, a big book, but there's so many places where I've outlined stuff and, and directions to start from. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about Where are you it. from, Marissa? I'm from, uh, well, I was born in New York, but grew up in New Jersey. Where about? Uh, North Brunswick, near Princeton and oh, New sure. Brunswick. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Near Rutgers. Yeah. Where do you go to school? Uh, I went to Cornell. Yeah, you're smart. Um, I figured that. Grad school at Carnegie Mellon in computer science. So, How did you end up doing this gig? Uh, you know, I've done a lot of different Wait, things. Wait, is this, is this on the internet? How can I yeah. watch this? Yeah, yeah, this will be... Jay, we're take, doing video of this too, right? Yeah. And uh, we, have we launched a YouTube channel for this? Uh, for the video, yeah, the podcast, right? Yeah, Yeah, and then um, the podcast itself will be... Uh, so the video will be on YouTube and the podcast itself will be on iTunes and Google Play. And a bunch of other places like SoundCloud. Where else, Jay? Uh, uh, Player.fm. Uh, yeah. And what kind of audience do you have? Um, this will get about um, this one in particular. You will get between one hundred fifty and two hundred thousand. You're downloads. kidding! Wow. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good podcast. Uh, what, what's your? You have an advertising model, or yeah? Which which is not really a great model. So it's mostly it's a this is yeah, a passion but if project. You got, well, if you get more eyeballs, you're going to get more revenues. Yeah, but you know, it's not it's not. And you know the, the CPM, the cost you know per thousand impressions is very high. It's like about a forty-five, fifty dollars CPM because we. Yeah, but you're getting a certain audience. Yeah, I'm hitting a high. I'm hitting a well, CNBC getting, demographic. You're getting the audience you want. Yeah, and you know I've had, I've had great guests. I mean, everybody from you to Gary Kasparov. Wow. Sarah Blakely, Ariana. I, I mean, that's I, fabulous. I, yeah, because it's not a business podcast; it's a peak performance podcast. Right. Because you all, it's all similar. Right. You know, um, you know, being around the right people, oh. uh, you know, honesty. Now, this is not your studio. Uh, well, this is the studio for the comedy club, right? So it is my studio. Oh, oh wait a minute! This is where they perform. No, downstairs they perform. Right, and then we took the second serve floor. Booze? Do you serve booze downstairs? Yeah. So, so you got a, you got a liquor license. Yeah. Does it stand on its own financially? The, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny for me because. I've always made money. What do you have, a cover charge? Uh, yeah, cover charge and then a two-drink minimum. So what's the cover charge? Uh, it's like $18. A, a person? Yeah. And then a drink is what, 12 bucks? Yeah, or 10 Okay, so... And then we do some food. So it's 38 bucks. Food is optional. Well... Food we mark up from the restaurant across the street. So, so it's all carry-in? Yeah. Huh. And we just do that mostly as a service. Right. So people can have dinner. What, do you, mark, what do you mark it up? 20%, 30%? 10 Ten, fifteen percent plus the gratuity for the kid bringing yeah, yeah, it in. Yeah, and when the, we encourage the comedians to encourage the audience to, to, to tip generously. Yeah, and okay. uh, and it's great. I was doing. Are you open seven nights a week. Yeah, and on, on what time? Ten o'clock. Eight o'clock and ten o'clock. We'll do shows on. Like, so you got a two-hour show. So yeah. you what you start at seven thirty and you're done at midnight. Um, yeah, a little tighter, more like seven thirty. What's great about New York? Yeah, he's all these things all over the city. The oh, greatest yeah. city on earth. Oh, no, it was great for me because, look, I had made money doing uh, mostly as an angel, angel investor mm -hmm. and starting my own businesses. and uh, But I wanted to do comedy. I've loved it since yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. So I started performing here. I saw that the owners needed someone else right. with business expertise. Right. So I was a comedian and I bought in. The audience doesn't know when I go up that I'm an owner of the club. Right. I never tell them. Good for you. So You got a partner? Yeah, is he, for, for here, yeah. So are you a promoter or what are you, a producer? What do you call yourself? Oh, oh for the podcast? Uh, well, no, for the restaurant, for the for the comedy show. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm a comedian. As now, far as the, the guys that come in, do you pay them? Um, the, yeah. The Seinfeld? Like yeah, Bruce? not Seinfeld, but uh, like if a normal comedian comes in, we pay him like 50 bucks. Now, if Seinfeld wants to practice a gig, he'll, he'll come here. He'll call you up and say, hey, look. Yeah. Let me know the next time he does it. Okay. Would you please? Yeah, yeah. That's what you owe me. Yeah. I don't want to fake it. I want, I want my I, wife and I to come and see In the him. past few weeks, it's been Seinfeld, and Amy Schumer did her SNL monologue. I don't like her. I don't like her. She's but too. she practiced it here. Uh, who else has practiced She's here filthy. recently? Um, uh, what I love about Seinfeld is he looks at life as it is without 
I'm not, I'm not a prude. Don't misunderstand me. You can read from the book. I use bad words. But, and you hold yourself back where needed. Oh, no, I, oh, really. Uh, maybe I'd have done better if I'd have held myself back a little more. Who the hell knows? In the beginning but, of your parole meeting, you held yourself back a little. But at the uh, end, well, I, no, you that was, bullshit. That was a leap of faith. Yeah. And I said, you know, screw it. I, he blew the 30-minute rule. Yeah. So he, what do you think? I was the biggest pile of horse shit I ever heard in my life. That was great. But then I liked how Bernie also walked out on the meeting with Perot. Yeah. So, people are everything. Uh, that's the name of the game. There ain't nothing. You know, take people off the earth. It's just a big round blob of dirt. You know, that's why um, I, this is a weird rule I have, uh, but my, I don't let my producer book guests if I think the guest cheated on their spouse. Good for you. So I just, I Well, I you know, personally... that's interesting. Pro and I were talking one night, and we were saying, you know, you want to be careful of people that you're in business with that you know wander because they cheat on their wife. Yeah, they'll cheat on you. Cheat on you. And as someone who with a lot of listeners, and I call this a, a, a podcast about peak, peak excellence, it's not an ex, it's not exemplary of, of, of peak performance if you're – if your personal life is, right. is is a mess. Now, some people can't help. It's like, it's like you said, things are volatile. Sometimes your personal life's going to be a mess for various reasons, right. but you should be, not be the, the main cause of, of the volatility. Right. Look, let me tell you. We were two kids. We fell in love. Uh, we had a long courtship, two years. We wanted to get married. I'm reading about Giuliani in the post today. about This is stupid for Christ. He's yeah. an old man. Yeah, and why is he? Because he's, he's got a so fucking ego. He's got a fucking ego as big as this room. That's why. But also, I think like medic, like health wise, he's not doing too well right now. I've seen him recently, and I think something's going on in his head. Could be. Yeah. Could, hey, look. Maybe you Alzheimer's. know, you know, we either ease into age, or we're disrupted by age. You know, I I, I don't like the fact that uh, I'm 82, but I can't fight it better that I'm 82 than I didn't make it to 82, right? Yeah. I mean, for 82, though, uh, you, you do pretty well. You well, I keep to, going. I'm not yeah. going to stop. I think that's the key, is if you Absolutely. ignore it and, and you keep going. Absolutely. I, I watch these guys that have hang it up arbitrarily at 65. Yeah, and uh, that, that's the most dangerous year of their lives. Oh, Steve, Steve Cohen's Ken. Nice Steve, nice seeing you how again. Are you? Good. That's life. Good. How about you? Oh Did God, you really? It. Amazing. Yeah, it was a perfect book. I have yeah. a lot of questions. He's got a million questions. He's the okay. best around. Okay. Say it'd be a great day for you. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll have some fun. But, Tom, but yeah, yeah, it was a terrific book. I went back and looked up some of those people because, that you know, like, some of those people, like, you didn't have nice things to say about Sandy Sigaloff. I mean, they yeah, he was a prick. Except you, know, you always made money off him, which is great. Every <laughs> time I got near him, I made money. All right? And he wasn't happy, okay? It was almost like a zero-sum game when you... It, well, no. It, it, he makes the point I make about be nice. Yeah. Of course, you're nothing. Yeah. Be nice. Hey, thank, by the way, for doing this. I'm happy to do it. You know, we've been on Pam for a while. Yeah. And I sent her a note because it was very nice what you said about her in the book. Like the, about who? Pam, your assistant. And all those people you remember and... Well, yeah, because anybody that thinks I'm saying there's no such thing as a self-made man is wrong. I'm saying as it relates to me and me alone and nobody else, I am the results of a lot of people's hard work, including well, I, my own. I think that is a very important principle. And, and you also say, you know, a, a secret of success is not a secret, but invest in people. Investing in people is, right. is very powerful. And then, you know, you have a lot of lessons about honesty, curiosity, attention to details, like the similarities between Pete Cunningham, Frank Blake, and Sam Walton, the way they walk, walk around their mm -hmm. stores. Mm -hmm. Looking at augers mm -hmm. or Frank whatever. Blake. Yeah, we're in goddamn Columbus. I got to go check something out. And he, by the way, he dressed like there was no light on in the closet. Nothing matches. And uh, uh oh, don't look at my clothes. Well, that's fine. You're, that's your business, though. And but Frank was Frank, and God bless him. He, anyway, he he's got this piece of paper, and we'll walk over, and we're looking at the plumbing department. An auger is a thing when you got a stopped up toilet. You yeah, crank yeah. it. I didn't know yeah, that. Son by of the a way, bitch. But... Yeah, well, that sort of was. You, like, you maybe sell three of them a year in every store. And he's going and check the price. I said, What the hell are you doing? He said, Well, somebody told me we were off our price on August. That's attention to detail. Yeah. That's like the story of Sam Walton going into a, another retail store, seeing how they. Hung well, he their... saw. He was running the five and dime. 
Yeah. And he heard about the store, and he went up there, and he wanted to know as much about it because that was a breakthrough. It was it was Kresge, which was then which became Kmart, but it was Kresge acknowledging that as they were, they were going to die, and it was Cunningham who pressed the idea huh. of the discount. But actually, it was a store in Rhode Island huh. where they actually had, and, and one here in, on Long Island called E.J. Corvette. You don't oh, remember, I remember that. that? Yeah. Oh, you know, I do remember Corvettes was in East Brunswick. Was well, that the same I think one? that he had a big store there, yeah. right? And and by the way, EJ, the guy that started it was Eugene J. Furkoff. So he took the initials EJ, and the Corvette name came. He was in the Navy, and the ship he was on was a Corvette. Ah, that's great. And that's and he started his first one in Westbury, and that was in the mid fifties, and shit. And they were television sets and radio that were then. Not that much in television sets, but they had portable radios and transistor radios and all kinds of shit like that. And it was uh, a lot of one-off stuff, a lot of closeout stuff. Huh. Jay, you tell me. Uh... I've been recording the whole time. Oh, oh, Jay, you didn't tell me. We're gonna we're gonna get started. Okay. So... Can't live with him. Can't kill him. Okay. <laughs> and um, Steve, if you ever, oh, if you ever want to interrupt or anything. Just yeah. Do we have the uh, mic on Steve too? Thank you. Yeah. See, he's like you. He treats everybody really well. If, if I was near Sandy, he's dead now. And my mother used to say to me, "You shouldn't talk about the dead." I get a pass on this. He was a prick. Who? Uh, Sigaloff. Oh yeah, hundred percent. No, but like a uh, bad like, guy. But oh, the way he fired like Bernie and well, the his theory was, if you fire somebody, that's not enough. You got to you got to destroy them because they might come back and hurt you. And, the, and the, here's an exact opposite. Jack Welch, when Jack Welch let somebody go, he made every single effort to make sure two things, that the guy looked at the future with promise and he left with his dignity and his self-respect. That was Jack Welch. You have the story in the book with, it, it, it seemed like he did attempt to, to do everything with dignity, no, but it made, also depends on no, two people. When he fired a guy... He wanted to make sure that guy left or that gal left with their dignity and their self-respect intact. Right, but I think you the way you describe um, him hiring Jeff Ilmel to, Ilmel to run... Um, he selected him. GE. He selected him. He was already there. Right, he, he selected him. Um, the, you know, And then he flew to Bob Nardelli. He flew to the... Um, he flew to Cincinnati first to, to McDurney, and then he flew to Nardelli. So I thought that, that was, was on a Sunday night. I thought that was great. Uh, but then you see, like, Nardelli was definitely offended... Yeah, that night, the interesting thing about when Jack got to there, Bob kept saying, look at my numbers, look at their numbers. Well, I, I don't understand this, I don't understand this. And then Bob uh, inferred that the decision was not just Jack's. And God bless Jack to his everlasting credit and his integrity. He said, no, Bob, I made this decision. I recommended this decision to the board, and the board agreed with me, but this is my call. Well, on that note, I want to introduce you. I have... Uh Ken Langone here, uh, and he just wrote an, an excellent book, which we're going to talk about. I love capitalism, an American story, and there's, there's, I just, Ken, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but there's so many great stories. It's, it's, it's not a long book. I, I can't recommend this book highly enough. There, there's so many lessons about business, success, building wealth, creating value, and just. Dealing with people, you know, and you and you and you interweave all of your own personal stories. People, uh, people might know your name, Ken Langone, from you know, as you, you were a co-founder of uh, Home Depot. Uh, I see your name dr whenever I'm driving around New York City. You can't help but see your name everywhere in the, the NYU Langone Health Centers. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you and I have have two things in common, two very important things in common. Not uh, hair, not hair, <laughs> not not hair, but. But our first jobs were both paper boys. Yep. And Newsday. we've both given over a billion dollars to charity. God bless uh, you. Uh, no, I, I mean, just you, Gabe. Uh, I haven't given a billion dollars. I don't know if I've charity. given a billion yet. I've given a lot. And, uh, but actually, the, the, the second thing we have in common is we've both been pitched by Bernie Madoff. Uh, you were you, pitched too? Uh, well, I was a pitch for different reasons. I, you know, this was long. We'll get to your story to say, and this this was long before the fraud was exposed. Right. I had a, was running a fund of hedge funds, and I pitched him to be an investor. Okay, and he pitched me to stop doing my fund and to be an employee of his. 
And you didn't do it. I didn't do it. Thank God. And he said, but I was very depressed afterwards. I'll tell you why. He said, um, look, I'm, I have great returns. You, I don't know where you're putting your money, so there's reputation risk. Um, and the last thing we need is to see uh, Bernard Madoff securities on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Holy shit. How <laughs> prophetic was that? Right. And then I left and I was depressed. Like, how am I ever going to compete in right. raising money against this guy who's up like a steady 12% right. a year? And, and other funds were calling me that moment saying, can you get, what is he doing? Can you get us in his fund? And then when, after the fraud was exposed, I called them all back and I said, do you remember that? Aren't call you glad? And none of them remembered making that no, call to me. No, that's human nature. <laughs> yeah. So, but we'll get to your story in a second. You were, you were, uh, uh, you know, HBO made a movie about Madoff and you yeah. were actually, uh, an actor played you in the, in the movie. Yeah, but a short guy. I, I understand, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that De Niro didn't want somebody playing me who was taller than he was. That's was, so funny. He was playing, he was playing Madoff, and he did a good job. Why did they put uh, specific? Oh, I'll, we'll get to everything. I'm just curious. Why did they, out of all the stories you could say about Madoff in, in an hour and a half movie, why they include uh, Madoff's pitch to you? I haven't the slightest idea because they never call me. Did I you never, somehow knew that story? Yeah, I saw it. When you saw it, I saw it. I, I knew nothing. Maybe about it was it. his last big pitch for you know that sizable amount. I, 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 Whatever it was, they, they stuck it in the story. But million. they they didn't they didn't call me want to verify it because it didn't happen. It was typically Hollywood license. They you know you're full of shit and I'm at that didn't happen that way. The way the book says it happened is how it happened. Well, here, here's what I want to ask you, and, and I know we're going to be skipping around the book a little bit, but you talk so much, and it's such a valuable lesson about how your main successes came from investing in. Good people. And we'll, 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 we'll get Not to my main successes, all my successes. All, all your successes, which is an extreme. People don't understand how valuable a lesson that is. Like oh. one bad person could ruin a multi billion dollar company and, and has on many occasions. But if you have a team of good people around you, billions of value could be created. Look, the human condition is spectacular. Nothing like it. As I said earlier, if there were no human beings on earth, it would be a round thing with some water and dirt and nothing else. Uh, you look at, you mentioned Sam Walton and you mentioned Pete Cunningham. What happened, here's what Kmart bankrupt, went bankrupt and probably gonna go out of business now. Same business that Walmart copied. It's the biggest corporation in the world today in volume. What was the difference? People, Home Depot. You had Rickle, Pergament Channel, Somerville Lumber, uh, Heckinger's, Scotty's, all these regional chains all over. You mentioned um, Home Co. You mentioned oh, Home. Well, that was Pat Farris started. Pat's effectively one of the four founders. We, we say three, but but Pat came a month or two after we started, and he was so much of the creative genius we had. He was. Pat is, I shouldn't say was, he's alive and kicking and doing well. He owns a hamburger joint out in Lake Tahoe now. Busy Beavers or some crazy name like that. And and we, we were four guys and, you know, we were passionate about what we did. We liked each other very much. We had fun. We all had different skills and talents. And the rest is history. Yeah, I mean... Um, uh well, let's talk about the 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 main. I have a lot of questions about your your people uh, identifying skills, whether they're good or bad, and the, the, some of the near misses you've had. But with Madoff, is it, such a clear case where he obviously is, was a, a an extraordinarily bad guy. But a lot of people still invested with him when he was pitching you. It was almost like you had an instant reaction. Like what was what was your gut telling you, and how did you see that? And I should mention also, you mentioned several times you're a poker player, which is, uh, involves a lot of people watching. Well, poker is as much studying people as it is studying cards. You know, uh, I would never want to play against Madoff because he was absolutely emotionless. Had to be. He's, he knows he's going down when he's talking to me. And you'd have thought he, the sky was blue skies the rest of his life. So, So what gave you... Like, I couldn't tell anything one way or the other the one time I met him. What gave you kind of the, the red flag? Well, let me, let, me, let me ramble for a moment. Let me back up. 
If I were teaching a course in business school today, and I was told by the place I could only use one book, I could only have one textbook, you won't guess what it would be. It would be the Bible. Mm. The Old and New Testament of the Bible, both. What I saw in Madoff when he pitched me that he was giving me something because he didn't have enough to go around for his other people that were around him 25 and 30 years. And in my head, I instinctively asked the question, how would I feel if I were one of those people that was an investor with him for 30 years and he's got this incredibly outstanding opportunity? This is what he's pitching to me, this, this fabulous opportunity, but it isn't big enough to give to all of his people. I said, you know, I'd be kind of pissed off. I'd kind of feel like, hey, that's not right. And so in the Bible, you know, what's the golden rule? Do unto others as you have others doing it. That's simple. It was nothing profound. It was nothing earth-shattering. It was nothing like I had a major breakthrough through in biotechnology or bioscience. It was a very simple put myself in their place shoes. Right. So, 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 okay. So that obviously is a, you know, was kind of the identifier for Madoff. What about, let's take a story like um, Frank, Blake, who who became the CEO of Home Depot after all of the, you know, after he ran through all the founding partners, he was sort of the first non-founder to become CEO. Right. And, and the- Well, no, Nordelli was. Oh, right, Nordelli was. But remember and, this. Remember this. Um, it's kind of sad the way it ended up with Bob. And I would say two things about Bob. The first four years he was at Depot, roughly the first four years, I, I can honestly say virtually everything he touched, he made better, okay? And one of the great things he did, and Frank will confirm this, he brought Frank Blake to Home Depot. Mm. Frank had worked with him at GE, and I've asked Frank more than once, Frank, if Bob wasn't there, would you have come to the Home Depot? He said, absolutely not. So he did inspire loyalty in his- Oh, and that was his whole game. That was Bob's whole game. But, but he but, didn't inspire loyalty among the company culture, ultimately. Well, he, uh, who the hell knows what's in people's heads. I, what I saw at the end was a more focused, in my opinion, a more focused effort on his part as to what's in it for him as opposed to what's right for the organization. You know, the Army has, has a, a practice you always feed the troops before you feed the officers. And I believe that, okay? My dad was what you would call a small person. He was a plumber with an eighth grade education. I don't mean, my, I think my father was the biggest thing in life, my mother and father, both of them. But in the context of how you describe people, they would be among the little people. If, if you measure station in life or economic status or whatever. And I suppose I'm sensitive to that because I came from, I'm of the little people. And I, I look at people today and I realize the ones I want to be around, the Frank Blakes of the world, and make no bones about it, uh, I can't think of anybody that stands up to Frank as a CEO of any corporation I've ever been involved in. And what, what's interesting is right after you've put him as CEO, um, you ran into a guy in your community who had also next Frank, day who Frank had worked for him at GE, right? And he said, "No, Frank, you made a bad no, decision." No, he for- said to me, and he, and he's a wonderful man, a very close friend of mine. And he said, "You know, Frank worked for me. He's no CEO." And I said, "Now, look, Frank was an unknown quantity, or an unknown quality, I should say. He'd never run a company before. You know, his his, acad- his academic record was." Singular. I mean, Christ, Harvard undergraduate, Columbia Law School, clerk to Justice Stevens of the Supreme Court, head of strategy for General Electric, number two guy in the Department of Energy. I mean, this this is heavy duty stuff. But he probably didn't know a hammer from a saw when, when Nardelli brought him to Depot. But there was some quality in Frank that, that you I, saw and that other people didn't. And I tell you what it was it was an incredibly brilliant guy who had this enormous well of humility. Frank and I went out and had lunch with Jeff Bezos last December, and I tell people, be careful with Bezos. He's smart and he's humble. Man, that's, that's a winning combination. 
A guy, a guy that no matter how gifted he is, can relate back to people not so gifted. That's a winner. That was yeah. Frank. How did you when you had uh, lunch with with Bezos? How did you see it in Bezos? How did you see the humility? What's an example? Well, he first of all, he goes. We go into this little boathouse he had on his property, and he goes in and he opens a refrigerator door and he brings out three salads that were pre-made with chicken on, and he puts it in front of us, and we sit there, and we're talking about. And he, I mean, it was like I was talking to a kid that had just graduated from Bucknell. And then after we had lunch, we went over and we sat in a different, in the same room, over by the window by the fireplace. And he, I felt like he had sucked everything out of my brain by the time I left. Hmm. He was more interested in Frank and me <clears throat> with all he's accomplished. I mean, th this is this guy's a winner, big time, big time. Hmm. So, so, you know, and it, Frank Blake. This thing that I, whenever Frank would come to the board of directors, he was had a strategy at Home Depot. Whenever Frank would come to a board meeting, if somebody interrupted what he was saying, he would immediately stop. And you could sense this intense interest in hearing every single word you had to say. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him 
on writing, Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance. It sounds like you know one of the, one of the lessons you talk about in the book or or reading in between the lines is that c a strong curiosity, uh, it, combined with an attention uh, attention to detail, is a, a key factor of of. I, I, I'm going to say a self serving thing. I'll drive you nuts with questions. I think a fundamental characteristic of an intelligent person is an incurably curious mind. They always want to know more. They always want great board members that I've sat on boards of asked a lot of questions. And the board members that you could forget about sat there like bumps on a log, didn't say a goddamn word. And you have to put a mirror under their nose to see if they were alive. Well, you know, it, it seems like you've been on so many boards. Not I mean, too many. But certainly you've also seen a lot of uh, bad decisions made about people. So what's what's a typical What's what's an example of bad like what's the why don't I talk about my mistakes in people? Yes. Okay. And there are two categories. <clears throat> One, I was fooled. Okay, I, I was wrong. The guy wasn't what I thought he was, and he never was. The other was is that as good as the guy was, the business we were trying to do fundamentally didn't have the potential that we thought it did. I've gone down in business with good people. They tried hard. They gave it everything they had. They were well qualified. It just wasn't meant to be. Well, or let's take the case of like Bob Nardelli, who who you recruited from GE, right. GE, GE to be CEO of Home Depot. He, the business was a good business. Home Depot was a great business. It still is. Right, but he was so Shop focused. Home Depot. He was so focused on uh, the numbers. And, he, and like you mentioned in the book, he, he took the low-hanging fruit that was available to, to increase profits, but ultimately couldn't infuse his personality into the corporate culture. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me back up. <clears throat> GE has a number of major businesses. Bob ran power systems. Healthcare was a big business. 
financial services was a big business. Aircraft engines was a big business. Each of those businesses were run as a separate corporation, had its own CEO, didn't have its own board, but it had its own CEO, had its own general counsel, its own CFO, and so forth. And each one dealt with their people the way they chose. So, for example, Nardelli would throw a big Christmas party every year for the key people, a lot of them. And we made a deal with Bob in early December. And he joined us a week after Jeff was announced. Jeff announced on one Monday, and we announced the following Monday that Bob was joining Home Depot. And Bob invited me to their Christmas party, the GE Christmas party. This was, he was leaving to come to us. And that night, one of the people that was in attendance at that party was a union representative, a high-ranking officer of the union that some of the people that worked in power systems were a member of. The glowing words he used about Bob as an adversary, I don't mean adversary, but the, the natural Union strain. Versus management. Yeah, management versus labor. Mm. And then the number of people I saw crying that he was leaving, I said, holy shit, I got myself a winner here. If, if these kinds of people can be that engaged and have that passion and that emotion for this man, wow. And that Bob Nardelli was different than the Bob Nardelli, in my opinion, five years later. What do you, what do you think changed in people? Because I noticed this with several of the people in the book, that at some point, um, I mean, initially they start off good or you view, you view them as, okay, this is they a person change. I want to do business I, with. I don't want to say good or bad. I'm just going to say they uh, change. All right. But like, let's take an example of either Nardelli or here's a person who was Great throughout the whole book. You 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 guys made a ton of money together. But Arthur uh, Blank, uh, who was a co-founder of Home Depot, it seems like at, at some point, every everyone gets like they become little schoolboys for a moment. Well, like, no, oh, you... you're fired as CEO. They get upset, and well, then they go and buy the Atlanta Falcons because they have so much money. Well, look, look Arthur is fabulous. Okay? Yeah, and this is no criticism. No, no, and a great partner. We were, we, well, Arthur triggered the whole process when he and Bernie and I, who were the executive committee, I asked Arthur one day, I said, okay, Arthur, Bernie stepped down and you were here and here you are now. What happens if you get hit by a train? And he said, we haven't got anybody. I said, whoa, whoa. You might have a heart attack. Forget about getting hit by a train. We, the, we can't, we can't uh, 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 suffer that. So we agreed to hire a headhunter to go out and see who was out there that could be Arthur's deputy or Arthur's successor. At the same time that was happening, we were developing serious morale problems in the company. And so a combination of not having somebody there if something happened to Arthur and the issues that were surfacing in the company, you know, if you go back to that period of time, 99 and 2000, Lowe's was the darling of Wall Street because they were catching us. They were comping better than us. They were open. I mean, it was just where they were in the process. We had twenty. We had maybe eighteen hundred stores, and they had seven or eight hundred. They were growing faster than we were in terms of percentage growth and number of stores. But we had issues, and I give our board an enormous amount of credit for recognizing that we had issues, and more importantly, doing something about it. And now I'm going to name a name, and I'm going to say, here's where they blew it. General Electric. Look at, look at the disaster General Electric is today. Where the hell was that board of directors? I say that self-servingly because Jeff pushed me off the board in 05. Uh, I will tell you that, that I had no trouble challenging Jeff as a director on certain issues. And, and initially, uh, I wanted to leave the GE board because there was this stress between Ardelli and Immelt. Even though Nardelli was now a depot, Nardelli always believed he got screwed. He should have had him else's job. His dream job in life was to run GE, and he didn't get it. And I think there was a certain amount of Bob, okay, I'm going to show you you guys made the wrong decision. And, 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 and more than once I said, Jeff, you know, I, I'll give you the math. I said, I got 300,000 shares of GE. I got 15 and a half million shares of Home Depot. Guess where my loyalty is? 
And I said, but be that as it may, I think I can do both jobs, but I, I don't like what's going on. It was, there was an issue about light bulbs where we threw them out, Bob threw them out. Uh, there was another issue about the credit card. And on top of that, I had taken over as, as chairman of the medical center. And we had an open process and Siemens got the business and GE lost it. I'm still on the board of GE by, and, and there was a couple of things I challenged Jeff about in private that I know didn't rest well with him. I mean, for example, uh, and it's hard to believe because GE was recognized as one of the models of great corporate governance. Uh, but on two occasions, Jeff came to the board and told the board who was going to be their lead director as opposed to the board saying, go in a room without him even in it and say, mm -hmm. okay, who do we want to speak for us? Mm -hmm. So uh, that was one example. And, and another time, he put together a small group of people to, help him be a better CEO. And I said to him, you know, in my opinion, you'd be better spending that time with your high potential people in the company or your customers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the, back to boards, uh, the Home Depot board, in my opinion, deserves a lot of credit. That board at that time, we made a tough decision. And we stood by it. And I think the company's better off because of it. But what, what was interesting to me in that story in the book was that here we're dealing with all these people who have made a massive amount of money, like money Some. from generations of their family, uh, like Arthur and, or Bob Nordelli. Arthur, Bob, Bernie, myself, Frank Blake. Uh, by the way, the guy running the company now, I swear to God, he's a carbon copy of Frank Blake. Absolute carbon and scary and, and, and into the bargain. One of the most competitive son of a bitches I've hey, he's wonderful. Craig Benier, spectacular. Spectacular. In in what way I wanna I wanna get back to my, my earlier thing, but uh in what way have you seen him to be competitive? He wants to win. How does he, he do it? Well how, how do you we see it? how we what we do in our company, online activity, merchandising, how we deal with our people, he's of the people. You know, so every way you look at Craig. You see a guy that, like you and I, need water and air to live. He has to win, but fair and square. And, and in a way, you can feel proud of yourself that you won. Right. So it's focused on the process of the company and where you see th where you have often seen things break down with people. The, what I'm seeing in the book is that at some point they get distracted by the the numbers, the the money that they're making, or the money that they have, or the title that they have, and this sort of throws them off from they're they're looking at the outcome and not the process. Well, when when's well, enough money? Now look, we all need something that if you let it get out of control, you're going to have trouble. Egos. If you don't respect yourself, don't expect anybody else to respect you. So you got to have that much ego to feel good about yourself, because that's all you got. I look in the mirror in the morning, I looked at the shaving this morning, I said, hey, pal, you're not the best guy looking out there, but that's all you got. Let's go kick it in the ass. Yeah, you're, you're 82, and I bet you could jog a mile. Well, I worked out in the gym this morning for an hour. I okay, did, I, did I, thir didn't. I did 35 minutes on the cross trainer, and then I did weights for 25 minutes. I did, uh, I did 105 crunchies on a crunch machine. Oh, my gosh. You know, because guess what? I'm going to die. I just want to make sure I look good when I'm in the box, okay? <laughs> Come on, you got to have a good outlook on life. So, so, but, but it seems like some of these people, they, let their, they, they were good people, and then at some point they hit a wall where their egos couldn't handle something that was happening. Either their egos or their perspective changed. Like it became about money rather than, hey, I'm, doing, I'm creating something of great value. I'm 82 years old. I go to work every day. I happen to have made the most profound decision of my life when I decided I wanted to marry my wife because she's got to be a special person to put up with my craziness, okay? If I could work 24 hours a day, if I didn't need sleep, I would work 24 hours a day. If you didn't pay me a nickel, I would work just as hard because I love what I'm doing. I'm having the time of my life. And this wonderful woman just says, that's him. I think in the book, I said, a friend of mine from high school met her, and he said, she said, you know, he's nuts. And she says, yeah, but every time we go out, I laugh. We had a good time. We still have a good time. So, so, so before the podcast started, I told you I was going to ask this. You've been married for 63 years. 61. Don't, Six, 61. It'll be, it'll be 62 September 15th. 
You met her when she was 16. Right. That, see, 18. Uh, if she was older, she'd have had enough sense to say, get the hell out of here, okay? <laughs> well, you're being, you're being self-deprecating. but No, I'm not. Well, I'm being honest. I'm, <laughs> I'm, look, I'm a little wacky. It's just the way I am. It's okay. Well, you are. I'm going to ask about that in a second. But I need to know, I haven't met maybe on less than the fingers on my hand people who have been married more than 60 years. How do you stay married for 60 years? You fight like hell. What do you fight about? Mostly small stuff. You know, the first fight we have is about the thickness of the pork chops. You know, but like, what's something where you got really angry where you were like, I don't oh, know if I can you, handle when you're this. Raising, well, when you're raising kids, that's a challenge. Okay? And thank God my kids, I mean, last night my oldest son and I went to Yankee Stadium. And I, when I got home, I told my wife, I said, I had more fun with Kenny tonight. It was unbelievable. He's 58 years old now. He'll be, he'll be 58 in December. And, and you know, and I say in the book, and I mean it, uh, I never have a phone call with any of my kids that we don't say we love each other at the end of the call. And I never go into a room when my kids are there that we don't hug and kiss each other. Okay? And so back to my wife and me, th there was this fabulous well of affection for each other. There is. There is this. I could talking about, I got a busy day today and I'm going to pick her up at quarter to eight. She's got a board meeting of one of her charities. And we're going to go out and find a place to have a hamburger. Just a hamburger. Maybe a bowl of chicken rice soup because I like chicken rice soup. And so it's the simple things in life. And we enjoy each other's company. We seek each other out. Uh, I think she's drop dead good looking. I really do, and she is. She's a she's a real handsome lady, and um, we have the same interest in people. You know, we have the same values. God bless her. I'm a Roman Catholic, and she decided to stay a Protestant, and that was 60 years ago. And that was not. You know, the world wasn't as wide open as it is now about faith and religion. It never was an issue. Well, it's it's interesting because I think faith is a strong part of your story of it's success. my whole story yeah and and well i mean what you notice early on in this book a, a lot of people i had this conversation yesterday with somebody a friend of mine said who she doesn't know anything about economics or capitalism or business but she says isn't successful business people and this is a common trope aren't successful business people usually dishonest? That's a kind of uh, a myth about business, but a lot of people believe it. Well, that's people, and I don't want to generalize, but those people, to me, <clears throat> are rationalizing their station in life and explaining away why I did better because I I did something they wouldn't do. I was dishonest. Uh, I see. So in some sense... It's envy. They're, Part they're, of the, partially. I'm not saying in every case it's envy. Are there dishonest, successful people? You bet there are. Are there dishonest failures? Yes. Dishonesty doesn't isn't discriminatory. But but you're in the book. You're uh, you have this blunt honesty throughout that you you you. It's almost like you know you have this sense that if I if you if you're saying to yourself if I always speak from a core integrity, good things will happen. You're trusting this process. I don't know if good happens. things will happen, but I'm going to sleep better that night. Well, like for instance, when you're when you're working at the the brokerage firm, I'll. I'll Pressbridge? Yeah. Uh, the, the president wants to front run uh, a, a customer right, trade, right. and you instantly walked into the, the head of the firm's I'm office leaving. and say, yeah, I'm leaving, or this guy has to leave. Oh, I know. I told him. I sat there stunned. It was. I don't think was, many people would do that on Wall Street. L l let me tell you, uh, a young man called me up last night at 10 o'clock. I got back from the baseball game. Yankees won 3 nothing. God damn it, they're looking good. I'm telling you, <laughs> oh, man. Huh? You a Yankee fan? Yeah, like when they're going. I'm telling you, me too. I'm fair with it. I'm like you. But let me tell you right this, these, and they're Is kids. Is that hockey or? No, no. <laughs> they're kids. These are kids. They're, yeah, they're, they're nobody's really over 30. These are kids. These kids have got runway. I was with Randy Levine, the president oh, of the Yankees. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. And I said to him, you guys are positioned for the, hell, we might win five World Series in the next 10 years. So, but, and so anyway, so I get home and, this friend of mine calls me up and what I talked to his son and I said, sure. So I reached out for his son, called him up and he was talking about a business proposition and what did I think? And I says, Buffett said this. And I'm you know, my best ideas I steal from other people or best quotes are from other people. 
And Warren Buffett said, and boy, he's so right, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and you can lose it in five minutes. Nothing is more true than that. Nothing. And so uh, are there dishonest people that succeed? Sure there are. Are, uh, are there people that are scoundrels that are financially successful? Of course they are. But it seems like the, the stories you tell where you were so bluntly honest, it's like like you were almost not diplomatic at all. Like with Ross Perot, you were the reverse of being diplomatic. You First were just of all, speaking. Let, let me tell you about Perot. And by the way, this was a great meeting which which ca- catapulted your success. Well, it was a key to my success. Yeah. He, he was my big career break. This was before both of you really had made that much money. Well, he was rich. You brought... His company was worth a lot of money. Well, yeah. you made it worth a lot of money. Well, I put it in the market. He made it worth a lot of money. He was his... He ran the company. Uh, and I, I met Perot, and I had an instinct, instantaneous like for the man. I just knew I wanted to be around him. And, and so in those 30 minutes, he was telling me about all these other firms telling him, it was very clear he wasn't saying this is what he believed. He was saying this is what he was told. And this was the mystique of Wall Street. And I figured, what the hell, Jack Height said, rule number one, get out of there in 30 minutes. And rule number two, don't swear. Now, let me, let me, let me digress for a moment. <laughs> You'll notice that one of the people that signed on to the book in the back of the book, the, 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 what do they call it, dust jacket? Is that what they call a book yeah. cover? Uh, it's Cardinal Dolan. <laughs> my, much of my life was in a trading room, and my beginning entry point in business and business and work was in construction. And in both those settings, bad words are de rigueur, okay? And I hope, I wish I didn't swear as much as I did, but. Uh, when Jim Kaplan, who, by the way, my collaborator, he was spectacular. I urge anybody who's thinking of writing a book, grab Jim Kaplan. He 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 wasn't good. He was phenomenal. He took out all the swear words. No, they're in there. The yeah. swear words are in there. Uh, and and look, I don't think the fact that I use a few choice four letter words should be a measure of me as a person or my character. Right, well, and I think Pro. So when so when Pro told me, okay, well, what do you think of what I said? And I said, and I thought, my God, I got thirty seconds left. And I said, well, Mister Pro, I'll see you next time, and we can talk more about what I got in my mind. No, no, what do you mean? I said, well, Jack Height said I got thirty minutes, and this is it. What do you think? And I thought, and I said, how could I be quick? I said, Mister Pro, that's the biggest pile of horseshit I ever heard in my life. And you're up against, you were a small, tiny firm up against Goldman Sachs, hey, Morgan hey, Stanley, the biggest guys in the country. I was betting a ranch, except I didn't have a ranch to bet. Okay, I mean, I but figured. You flew across country, and you were willing to, to have them just throw you out. Well, I'm not throwing me out. I was willing to say, hey, look, this is me, and what you just said to me is not what's happening, what's going to happen. It's simple. I'm going to decide I can put a price on the value of your company, and I'm believing in myself and my firm that I can go out and persuade people to buy your stock at that valuation. That's it was that simple. So, but that style of of blunt speaking, almost without caring what the other person's thinking, because you're confident in your integrity and what you're saying, that won you many deals. I would say that's it that put was me your, on a map. Right, and in addition to obviously, when he asked me about the prospectuses, and I, I tried to finesse that. He bring in that, bring all the deals down. You all the prospectuses of the deal. I didn't have any. I hadn't done one. So I thought he'd forget he asked me. So I, he dropped me off at the airport. Said, what about those prospectuses, Ken? I said there aren't any. Look, what do you mean? I said I haven't done any, Ross, before you. And he, thought, I wait a minute, bro. And you, you had already had like three months. You were yeah, a couple of months. No, about a month, month and a half. I met him in, I think, around March of 68. And this might have been maybe even four weeks later. Uh, and I said, Ross, don't worry about it. Your company's so strong and so good, nobody can screw your deal up. But I said, if I do a great job for you, I'm made. So I said, I got all the risk. So, so your sales technique in that approach was basically saying, not only being blunt, but saying, you you have skin in the game more than like just some. I had far more than him because you know what, 
this was my what my route to stardom or or to oblivion well why did you value it you talk about how you valued it a hundred times more ultimately 115 times more but but what what made you think other than all those bigger firms that it was worth that much well you didn't say initially you probably had an investor right let me tell you what i saw I saw Ross Perot, first of all, and I was right, being one of the great businessmen of all time. I saw the way he stunk integrity and truthfulness. How, how he, what? How, how he, how he, I said he stunk. He, 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 his odor was honesty and integrity. Uh, oh, I get, I get okay? Uh, and the guys around him yeah. was scary, like he had a goddamn machine and a mold and turning these guys out. They were, and they were all alike, honest, direct, hardworking, aw shucks. I mean, I said, I've never seen anything like this in my life, ever, ever, ever. And I said, I don't give a shit what price you put on it, I can sell the stock. I can do it. I was, it was a little bit of my bravado about me being able to pitch people on this great company. And by the way, that's what happened. But it was there was nothing like it, and and when I met Ross and I met his family, every single thing I saw about Pro, all the way up to him running for president, only reinforced my fundamental belief. Remember Pro with a goddamn stick yeah. with a chicken's foot, yeah. About about the who was talking about the deficit before anybody else, who was talking about uh, the sucking sound from Mexico. Remember the big <laughs> giant NAFTA, sucking yeah. sound. This guy, he was, that was 25 years ago. So, so given that this was such a high stakes deal for you, you were, you were a young guy making your name, pitching now, against- No, it wasn't high stakes because nothing from nothing is nothing. Right, but if it worked out- Oh, was, that was, there was a, a lot of upside. There was a lot of upside. Yeah, so- I, so I tell my kids about me, I say, I would rather be me with my father than you with your father. <sighs> Why? Because all I could do from where my dad was in economic status could go up. But so what? What would you? What do you think were the key points in the in such a high stakes deal for you to to win? What were the key selling points that you did that Perot recognized that got you the deal over a Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley? I was going to tell him the raw truth, very simple. And he uh, sensed that. I, I, the old saying, "Keep it simple, stupid." Mm -hmm. I said, "Ross, this is how it works. I'm going to tell you what I can sell your stock for, and you're going to bet that I can do what I said I was going to do. That simple. Mm -hmm. That's what we did." And, and of course, I, you know, he, uh, once he decided to give us the business, then you go through the process of putting together a prospectus and lawyers and documents and shit. And one day, I brought a bunch of lawyers, Wall Street lawyers, white shoot lawyers from Wall Street down. Yeah, so nice and proper. And, <laughs> oh, so nice to meet you, Mr. Perot. And so he takes us to a, a, a barbecue joint down below his offices, right in the same complex. It was Johnny Cummings barbecue pit. And so he's got all these lawyers around and we waiting with our, it was a cafeteria type thing. So here are these white shoe lawyers with trays and me, and I know I could see what's going on. I'm watching Perot look at him to see, he had, he had a great sense of humor. He had, he's wonderful. And Ross, you, you do nothing but laugh around Ross Perot. He's, uh, I wish I wish the world knew him better than as a politician because he's he's truly a remarkable human being. So anyway, so we're up there and this guy Johnny Cummings had a filthy, dirty rag that he's wiping off the top of the cattle with and looking at each of us with our trays on the, on the little thing that just slide on. What do you have, boys? And one of the lawyers, oh, I don't know. What do you suggest? And Pro had set Johnny Cummings up, and he said, "Well, sir," he said, "people down here, we got this great barbecued armadillo. Ain't nothing like it. You might want to like it." And he said, "Well, because the lawyers are all trying to please Pro because he's our client." And uh, he said, "Well, well, I suppose I'll try it." And well, how do you like it? What do you mean? Well, you want a rare, medium, or well done? And he said, "Well, what do you think?" Only one way to have it. Well done, because it can be a little tough. And because it was barbecue. So now we're sitting around at lunch, this round table, about seven of us, and I'm watching Perot, and I could see he was having the time of his life watching these 
highly proper Brahmins, if that's what they were, all, you know, waspy, Wall Street, white shoe law firms. And I said, this son of a bitch is having a good time right now. I, I kept it in my head. Now, normally, <clears throat> the day of the underwriting, you have uh, a lunch, a nice formal lunch at one of these established then clubs in Wall Street, the Wall Street Club or the Downtown Associate, or one of the clubs. So we're now we had the offering in the morning at 10 o'clock. We released the stock. The stock did very well. It came out at 16.50. And the first trade was 23 or $24 a share. It was a phenomenal success. And he said, where are we going for lunch, Ken? I said, oh, I got a the very, very exclusive club that we're going to have lunch at, the Umbrella Club. Umbrella Club? I said, yeah, Ross. I said, there's nothing like it in New York, and I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> what I had done, I had taken a, hand, a hot dog stand lady in one of those carts, and I paid her to go in the garage of our building, and I brought in the picnic table and two picnic benches from my backyard in the garage of this building. And so we walked down to the garage. He thinks we're going to get a limousine and drive someplace. And there's a goddamn umbrella on the stand. And I said, Ross, welcome to the Umbrella Club. <laughs> I mean, it's shit like that. Uh, did he appreciate it? Oh, he loved it. Oh, yeah. He has a picture in his office of him and me standing with a lady under the goddamn umbrella in the garage. So, so this reminds me also of so many of your stories. And I've never done this in my life you vacation with your customers and your colleagues and I want to, yeah because i love them they're good oh, i don't want to be on vacation with somebody i don't like jesus christ that's torture yeah but i figure i always figure oh i spend so much time with these people vacations when i can't get enough of them i just told you if i could go without sleep i'd do it 24 hours a day and i think that's i think people there, there's really no shortcuts. Like no, you have to you, get under the skin of. Let me tell you what. Don't fake. There are people I don't like. They know I don't like them, and I don't want to be around them. Because you have no time for it. Not that I have no time for it. I don't want to be a fake. I don't want to be nice to somebody that I don't particularly enjoy being around. I'll be polite to them when I see them, but I'm not going to go out of my way to go out and have a pizza with them, which is what I might do with good friends of mine. Hey, let's go up to DiMaggio's in Port Washington and have a pizza and a bowl of escarole and bean soup. Do you want to how, die and go to heaven? How come you're looking at me when you say people you don't like? <laughs> no, no, Steve, I like you. Uh, Everyone likes I, Steve. <laughs> you, know, you, you, know, you guys have got a great smile. How can you... so, so the other thing is, from early on in your career, even when you were a high school student, you had multiple ways you were making money. You were always looking for... A, a buck. Uh, yeah. And I don't think that ever stopped. Like, when you talk about Ross Perot, like, uh, this was obviously a big deal for you, but I'm assuming at that time you were working on many deals and that, ha that happened to be the biggest. So that's no, the one that was, about. that was That was the deal. I had a lot of... I was selling brokerage. I was selling bonds and stocks to institutions. But this was me totally focused on a single company. I lived it and died it. I lived it and died until we sold out to General Motors in 84. So, so, but at, during that time, you were obviously, Home Depot was... No, Home Depot, we, we didn't, we started Home Depot in 78. And that was 10 years after I took Ross Perot public. Right. And we offered Ross, remember the story, we yeah, offered yeah, Ross... Yeah, you offered him 70%. Yeah, 70% of the company. And he had a guy, a nice man, by the way, and he just... At that point in time, who the hell knew the formula was going to work? You know, if you'd have told me in June of 78, well, you're going to have 2,500 stores and you're going to be doing $100 billion in sales, I'd say you better see a shrink because you got terrible hallucinations. Yeah, I mean, you were, you were raising money off of a business plan for Home Depot that had never been seen before, basically a big box retail chain. The biggest variation was the amount of business we, could said, we said we can do in one store. Back in 1978, the biggest hardware stores in America, there were four of them in Louisville, Levy's, L-E-V-Y apostrophe S, of Louisville, and I think they were doing about $4 million a year each. Our initial plan was $12 million a box. 
and the numbers didn't work at 12 million. And so Bernie Arthur was putting the projections together, and the author says, Bernie, it doesn't work. So Bernie says, give me the numbers. So Bernie stretched out 12 and put 16 in. So Arthur, now they work. And Arthur said, where are you going to get the 16 from? He said, we'll get it. I think our, our, probably the average Home Depot store today does something like $40 million a year in business. That was the difference. But the, but the secret weapon always was and always will be those kids that put the aprons on every morning. That's a secret weapon. They're, they're, they are the magic source. They're it. Right, because every employee at Home Depot is essentially a salesperson. Well, they're a salesperson, but also they understand the goal is not to sell something to somebody. The goal is to make somebody happy and satisfied that they came into the store. Okay? And don't sell somebody a $40 item if a $2 item can do it. I told you the story about the kid in there about with a washer. Yeah, he and gave it to him. Ultimately, he, he came could back have sold the guy kitchen. a whole faucet. The guy didn't know what the hell he was doing. Yeah, here's your faucet. Go home. And the kid said, "Wait a minute, that's not broke. What do you got to do?" And he takes a he had a little sc- screwdriver in his pouch and he unscrewed the brass screw, and and gave him, tore open a little glassine bag of assorted washers, put the right washer in, put a screw back in, and said, "Here, it's all done." We, uh, if if you want something that we don't have and we know it's in another store, in a competitor store, we'll tell you, go there. They, they got it. We don't have it. Sort of reminds me, actually, of um, when Borders Bookstore started. You think of it as big box, street, you know, retail chain. Um, they were sort of known versus Barnes & Noble. Uh, their staff knew about books, could talk to you about books. But that didn't work out for them, ultimately. I don't, I don't know why I've never really followed... Their particular look, well, because it was, look, I'd rather be lucky than smart, for sure, because I ain't smart, so I thank God I got some luck. Well, But, but <laughs> we, we happen to capture <clears throat> a business which is fundamentally a solid business today. Still a great, great business. You know, I want, I want to be in business with an honest person, but I want to be in business with an honest person in a business that has a future. The home center industry, particularly now where equity values, in other words, people now have value in their homes over what they owe on the mortgage. So they got something to protect. They got something to invest in. This is a great business. It's a fabulous business. And do you think, um, like you, you mentioned, you were meeting with Jeff Bezos a few months ago. Uh, it's uh, this this type of business seems like one where you have to go into the store and see the equipment. Well, you, yeah, and well, but don't forget, no, no, don't. We'll do about seven billion dollars online sales this year. Mm. We st- what? And let me. You brought this up, and it's a good point. One of the greatest things to happen to Home Depot is Amazon. I don't think we would have the maniacal focus on offering our customers alternative ways to shop if Amazon wasn't out there. Mm, Amazon, well, I think a great competitor will make you a better competitor if you got the guts to hang in there, if you got the stay in power, if you got the resolve, if you got the fire in the belly. Um, We now offer our customers, you can sit in your ass in your living room and buy whatever you want from us We'll deliver it to if you'd like, and this is our edge. Or if you want to pick it up in the store right around the corner. So, so you know, I'm curious about, you know, you, you mentioned staying power, and that's so important on a business level, on a psychological and personal level. 1974, one of the worst years to, to, to maybe start a business in that economy or, you know, a big recession was, was happening and, and continuing. Inflation was about to start. Uh, you started your private equity firm. I know, not a private equity firm. Or venture capital. A little brokerage firm that was going to do some venture capital and look for deals. And obviously, no one was buying stocks, so the brokerage no. firm... <laughs> we was, struggled. Yeah. And, and uh, You must have been scared. I mean, I read scared. the story. I was terrified. Like, what, you'd wake up, would you wake up at 3 in the morning, like, panicking? Uh, let me tell you what God has done for me. He's always made sure I got a good night's sleep. Okay. Uh, what would happen when you would wake up at 3 a.m. wondering if you were how you were going to pay the next mortgage on your house? Never got there. Never got there. I, I, 
thank God, my wife and I, you talk about the marriage, we always live within our means. We never owed anybody any money. We got a mortgage on the house. But my mortgage payment on this beautiful house was $356 a month, okay? The house sold for, when I sold it, it sold for many multiples of what I paid for it. But back to, uh, the, I think there needs to be a certain tension in life. Uh, one of my real close pals is Stanley Druckenmiller. Uh, really, history will dictate he's a legendary investor. Now, I've been an investor with him for 35, 40 years. He's never had a down year. Never had a losing year. Mm. This guy is so goddamn competitive. He has to win. Because he, he gives money away to charity like you can't believe. He's legendary for giving money. There's a great organization up the road called the Harlem Children's Zone, Promise Academy, and Pro Harlem Children's Zone, Jeff Canada founded. Stanley is the is the is the juice in the whole thing, and Stanley it, it's beyond money for Stanley, nothing to do with money. The way you keep the score, you know it's it's interesting because you mentioned you've been an investor with him for forty years, Ross Perot. This is like what fifty years ago? Yeah, fifty it's years 50 ago. Fifty years ago. Yeah, because I called him last two weeks ago and said, Perot, we've been hanging out with each other for fifty years. So so. People, you know, when you surround yourself with these good, honest people, it's like it, you you grow up together. You grow up together. You you start with nothing. When you met Drunken Miller, he was someone a trader's assistant for for somebody, and you 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 sort of find the right people that, and, and you say this is your team, and you grow up with that team, and look look at all of you are billionaires. <laughs> Not all of us. Some Cause, of us. Because of the power of compounding. By the way, extent. by the way, I don't know where they get the notion I'm a billionaire, because I don't know what I'm worth. And you know what? It doesn't. I know I can pay my bills. Okay. I know. Uh, I have my wife. God bless has got wonderful taste, and we've got beautiful homes. And I know I don't worry about money, but I do worry about money. Don't ask me why. But every morning, my first thought, if I don't get off my ass and get going, I might go broke today. Really? Yeah, I, look, a, a racehorse wants to run all the time. Would you actually think you could be at risk? You feel that No, tiny I have fear. no debt. I can't be at risk because I don't owe anybody any money. But you feel that little fear. I, it's a fear that starts out when I was probably six or seven years old. But you said earlier, it's like it's like everybody needs some tension to keep yeah, going. Yeah, I got my own tension. This is the tension. And and, and look, um, I'm blessed. I you know, I I've got I am so blessed in starting with my bride. So well, going back to my mother and father. These were simple, humble hardworking, uneducated people. But they had this wonderful capacity to give their children unconditional love. My father used to be so angry with me. I wish I had a nickel every time my father would say to me when he was pissed off at me, if I never see you again, it'll be too soon. Okay, and five minutes later, he's hugging me and kissing me. You know, it was with the emotion of the moment. That's a great, base to have. So this bride I married, okay, and I know one thing and I said it in the book. If I flopped, she'd still be around. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. My sons, my sons are totally, totally, I don't want to say I'm impressed, but my success doesn't matter to them. I'm dead. That's all. My, we sat last night at Yankee Stadium. I'm eating a hot dog, and Kenny's a vegetarian. He eats no meat. He's a runner. He's a great athlete, great shape. He's sitting there eating a... He's got a hot dog roll with some cheese on it instead of a hot dog in it. He's got a big bowl of salad, and he's got some fruit. And I'm having a hot dog. And anybody in America can do that. And we had a, We had the time of our life. You mentioned that earlier that, you know, they have you as a father and you had your father as a father and that, you know. I you, had a better deal than they did. <laughs> right. You mentioned that it was a better deal because maybe it gave you that tension, that hunger of like, I've got to do six jobs simultaneously while in high school 
and and then I uh, and then I'm going to figure out how to each stage of your life you're figuring out a new innovative way to make money. What's your kids' tension? How do you give them the tension? Well, first of all, um, they're very independent. They have their own interest. Uh, I would say <clears throat> uh, that my politics are different than theirs, and no hard feelings. You know, they, I think they come at it uh, in a more would say balanced way than I do. They're not, they're libertarians. They're not political. I'm, I'm a conservative Republican. I suppose I'm a libertarian too. But uh, we respect each other as human beings. And certainly I am their father. That is, their mother and I got together and they're the result of us getting together. That's the way people show up on earth. And... Uh, I don't crowd them and they don't crowd me. And when we're together, we love each other. Uh, the other night, my son, Steve, and my youngest son called me up around 9.30 and just wanted to talk about nothing. And I wanted to talk about nothing and we talked for nothing for five minutes and that was it. Uh, I think the thing I would, I would hope is, um, I think I'm more ordinary than I am extraordinary. I don't know because I think that consistent, super consistent, Blunt honesty, the the belief that investing in people is the only key to success, um, the 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 curiosity, the humility, the 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 be diversification. Careful, be, be, careful of my, be careful of my humility. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because I, I even challenge myself sometimes. Am I really sincerely being humble, or am I playing to the crowd? Okay. Uh, either way is okay, though. <laughs> well, it is, but. But when I say I'm not terribly intellectually gifted, that is not uh, uh, an effort on my part to be falsely humble. I don't think I'm necessarily gifted intellectually. I'll kill you with energy. Well, and also clearly you were good at spotting that. Well, I got a great nose for people. Where did I learn one of the great lessons I got how do they size people? Because what you do after a while, you, you slot people. You meet somebody and say, okay, I know what he's like because he's like that guy I knew there. Yeah. And you, you put him in a bucket. When I was a caddy, <clears throat> it was interesting how I could slot somebody by walking 18 holes of golf with them, carrying their bag. Huh. Whether they were a pain in the ass, whether they were nice, whether you wanted to be with them, you know. And, and 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 I say in the book one of my one of the things I love to do if I'm going to hire somebody I like to take them to a restaurant and see how they treat the waiter or the busboy. Good lesson. Yeah. You know you can't. You know we take the all these. Again, I don't mean it in a pejorative way. We take all these little people. They were they they're the ones that really make our lives so fun. You know, whether it's my driver Alvaro. You know, I'm a pain in the ass. You know, I'm always got to be here, there. This guy doesn't know he's working nights or days. I told him Sunday, you got to pick somebody up Sunday night and bring him out for dinner. Okay. Uh, now, you know, he'll drop me off at the office and say, can I go to the gym? I said, do what you want. I'm in the office all day. So he goes to the gym. You know, it's give and take. But Alvaro is a very precious Pam Goldman, my, my assistant. Christ, take my eyes out of my head before you take Pam away from me. Some people are probably afraid to give this much praise to people around them, right? I don't know. Like, they'll be, like, let's say, aforementioned Pam, what if she now says, if I'm so valuable, why don't you? I'm sure you're very generous with these people, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, I've been in places, I'm sure James has too, where people are afraid to be nice to you because they don't want you to feel too good about yourself. Well, they're sick. They're sick. I uh, will go back to Jack Welch. Jack Welch never missed an opportunity to praise somebody or thank somebody or compliment somebody. Never once. Hmm. Little note. Yeah. I do the same thing. I must use, I'm not exaggerating, I bet I write, I bet I write a thousand notes a year. Yeah, handwritten notes that you said to people? Handwritten notes, yep. I, I, don't, I don't use email because that's a dangerous goddamn thing. So I tell somebody in an email, call me up. 
I can't figure they tap my phone. So I'm not because I'm doing something bad, but people have a habit of misinterpreting what you write. Yeah. But I, I you know, uh, somebody writes me a note. I wrote him a note back. Pam says, "Yeah, Ken writes thank you notes for thank you notes." So it's it's a it's a lot of. Time, like a thousand thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes a year. Yeah, it's a lot of time. And then, I, I had some and then guys, vacationing with with I, your I had some guys telling me the other night that they keep my notes. I says, well, "What the hell are you doing that for?" Throw them out. You know, there's no value after I'm gone. But look, people, every single one of us wants to feel wanted and needed and respected. And I, and I I I believe this. I think the three most powerful things in life is to say, pat in the back for somebody, say something nice to them, and show your own passion and enthusiasm for what you're doing. You know, if somebody sees you having a good time, they'll say, maybe I ought to do that. He says, look at the goddamn good time he's having. So, so, so pat someone on the back. A kind word, a thoughtful gesture, and passion and enthusiasm for everything you're doing. Everything. I, Pam goes out and gets me a half a corned beef sandwich. I'm sitting looking at that corned beef sa- half of that corned beef. Sa- I'm having the goddamn time of my life because I'm sitting. I'm going to have some and, and a bowl of chicken rice soup. That's what I typically have at my desk if I don't go out. You know, and and uh, what do I love? I love meatloaf. I love uh, pizza. I love pasta. God, Christ, I could eat pasta every Wait, night. Wait, so you're? I mean, you're 82 years old. Who? <laughs> 82. Right. And a lot of nutritionists wouldn't approve of your diet. <laughs> sure they would. I don't eat much meat. Okay. I don't eat much meat. I exercise. Do you eat three meals a day? I typically eat three meals a day. Uh, I stay away from egg yolks. I, I don't use any butter. If I go to an Italian restaurant, I tell them to give me the crust of the bread, the, you know, the ends of the bread, and a little dish of olive oil so I can dip the bread in the olive oil which is healthier for you than the butter Um, I love a hot dog Um, I eat mostly egg white omelets in the morning so I don't have cholesterol Um, I work out religiously every day I I, I didn't believe I didn't start that until I was 75 David Novak the guy that was chairman of Yum I was watching Christ, he was turning into an Adonis, and I said, what the hell are you doing? And he said, oh, I had this guy that worked out with me. So he's the owner of Burger King. <laughs> oh, no, no, David Novak was the, uh, was the fa- he was effectively the founding director, founding guy of, they spun out the restaurants from Pepsi, and he, he was a the guy they put in with huh. Andy Pearson. And David was CEO and did a hell of a job. Anyway, he was looking like Adonis, and I'm saying, what the hell are you doing? He had this guy, so he hooked hook me up with the guy, the guy, uh, Darshan, uh, oh, I want to say Bouger. So he lived with me for two weeks. It was like boot camp. Huh. He got me in a routine. He got me into what I eat. And I eat a lot of fruit. You know, I'll eat a pound of cherries. I love cherries. I always love cherries. I like grapes. Um, uh, I drink in moderation, maybe two or three glasses of wine a week, red wine and Maybe two or three glasses of white wine. Do you journal? Do you, do you write down uh, like a diary? I write nothing down. How do you remember? Like you remember every detail of conversation from like the nineteen fifties. It's scary. My mind. I'll tell you a story. I think I don't think I'm. I don't think I remember things as well. Well, as you I'm going to tell you a scary a scary story. There's a no, there were a series of interviews I did with radio stations in connection with a book, and one of them was up at Albany, New York, and the guy gets on the phone. I'm on on my phone, and of course I'm being broadcast, and he tells me that he was raised down the street from me in Roslyn, his name. And I said, oh. Now, I was I worked in a butcher shop, and next door to the butcher shop was a drugstore. <clears throat> and he said to me that his father owned the drugstore. I said, you mean Orlando Massa? Yes, that was my father. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. I said, hey, what ever happened to Roland Respati? Now, I hadn't mentioned that name in more than 60 years. Roland Respati was Orlando Mass's nephew, and he used to work in the drugstore after school, and he was my brother's age, which is five years older than me, and I only passingly knew Roland Respati. 
And he says, oh, my God, that's my cousin. I said, yeah. I said, whatever happened to him? I don't know where the hell the name came from. I got a good memory, though. I do, I do have a fairly good memory. Yeah, because then, I mean, you're telling stories. From but I also had pretty good files. Let me tell you one wonderful story out of the book. This just happened. In the book, I mentioned that I joined the labor's union to work in construction on the Long Island Expressway in 1954. About two weeks ago, I get a letter from the president of that local telling me he'd read my book and he noticed in the book that I belonged to the local union, 1298 International Hard Carriers Union. And he went into the records and he found my applications for membership in the union, and he sent me photocopies. So I joined in 54 for the summer, and I joined in 55 for the summer. And in the text, it was cute. He said, I'm probably the only guy that was a member of the union that was a, became a billionaire, which is kind of, I don't know if I'm a billionaire, but I'm just saying that's what the perception was. Well, but also, I, I think it was that particular union where you mentioned you were always looking for opportunities to make money, while often people in the union would wait for the union to give them father, opportunities. No, my father, my right, father, father, my father. Most union guys, trade union guys, plumbers. When they're out of work, they go to the union hall and they sit there, and a boss will call in and say, "I need three plumbers, or I need two electricians, or whatever it was." And my father didn't do that. My father, my father got laid off today. Work was done, John. There's no more work. We're done with the job. He, mom. He, my father was meticulous. In fact, there's a picture in the book of a bunch of plumbers. And if you look closely, my father's got a necktie on underneath his coveralls. It's in the books. It's in the pictures. So anyway, so so my dad we would go home and he'd say to my mom, Angie, I just, I'm out of work. I've got to start going out looking for a job tomorrow. And he would go from construction site to, there's a lot of construction going on after World War II. And my mother would wash his coveralls, which she did every week anyway, and she'd iron them that same night. And and the next morning, he, he'd have his lunch pail packed with a thermos in it and his and his uh, his coveralls, his, his overalls. And he would go from job site, and let's say he got the one job site at 11 o'clock in the morning, and the boss said, yeah, I can use a plumber. He'd go, can I start now? And the guy would say, sure, you can start now. And, and my father always managed, because two things, my father worked his ass off. So when somebody hired him, they knew they were going to get their money's worth. So we had a reputation among the plumbing contractors that if you hire Johnny Lyon going, you're going to get a good day's work. And and so the union guy showed up at my home one night time and complained to my father, you know, Johnny, it's not fair. You're always working, and we got guys down at the hall sitting there for days. And my father says, hold it. I got two kids to feed. I got a mortgage to pay. I got put bread on the table. I don't. I can't sit there and play pinochle all day long. And he says, I pay my dues. I'm a member of the union. I'm not doing anything wrong. I, I'm, 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 I go to the union meetings. I'm a good union work. I'm loyal to the union. I'm just not going to wait. I'm going to be an entrepreneur while I'm in the union. Well, it, and it reminds me of when you were in high school working for the butcher shop you just mentioned, and you forsake your salary to... Uh, I forget the exact. No, no, one. that was no, that was when I was picking up cardboard from the liquor store. Right. Okay. So, and you were you you were selling no, the boxes. That, and, well, the guys told me the guys on the garbage truck told me I I noticed how careful they were with the boxes. I thought how, I thought they just throw it in the back of the truck. We didn't have those big trucks like you got now. Most garbage trucks were like dump trucks. In other words, they just throw the garbage in that, and then they'd go to the dump and hoist it and throw it in. They became with these compactors, which are much more efficient now. Those trucks weren't around in the 40s and 50s. And I noticed these guys were breaking the boxes up, and I wouldn't do with that. Oh, we get a lot of money for that. So I went back to Lenny, and I said, Lenny, Lenny Altman, good guy. I said, Lenny, uh, got an idea. I said, how about if you don't pay me anymore? The only problem was I couldn't sell the boxes day to day. I said, if you'll let me stack the cardboard up here, I'll break the boxes up and stack the cardboard here under this. He had an overhang in the back, in the, in the back outside of the store. He had an overhang and it was a porch. And I said, if you let me put it there every two or three weeks, I'll move it. He said, yeah, go ahead. I said, you haven't got to pay me anything anymore. 
I think that's one thing you obviously value is hard work, and you call out people. You know, you'll talk about stories in the book, and you'll say, "Oh, so and so made a lot of money, even though he didn't do anything." Yeah, and eventually you would distance yourself from those people. Well, like your first partner at the at at, at your firm, um, or the other partners, and he didn't. Well, he had a mo- mindset. He couldn't sell stocks if the market wasn't bad. Okay, uh, and I said to him, "I said, you know, you got kids to feed." Home and tell them you got, you're not going to feed them because you can't sell stocks because you don't like the market. Again, this, which mirrors the story of, that your dad told the other union workers. It's a, yeah. it's a consistent theme, and it also reminds me of go when, getter. My old man's great great expression was, "The guy's a go getter. This yeah. guy's a go getter. That guy's a go getter." Well, it's like when you started at the brokerage firm and you asked for the 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 clients where there's no business happening. I, I said, "Look, I knew I was. I look." On the one hand, I'd like to think I'm humble. On the other hand, I'm one cocky son of a bitch, okay? I knew I could sell. I knew I could sell. Like, would you just call, cold call? Yeah, of course I'd cold call. Hell, yes. Hell, I, one of the biggest accounts I had was a Kroger company in Cincinnati, and I stumbled onto that because I was sitting waiting to get in to see the CFO who I didn't know and never met him before, and I noticed the gal, it's the secretary, is getting all these calls about the price of Kroger stock. And I, so I said to her, her name was Marion Alt, A-U-L-T, nice lady. And I said to her, uh, they call you all the time for the stock. She said, I was waiting and I could not, not hear. Yeah, they call me all the time. So I got back to New York and I called her up and I said, um, how would you like it if I called you every morning and told you what Kroger stock opened at? And I called you every night. This is when the market used to open up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it used to be 10 to 3.30. And I said, I'll call you at the end of the day and I'll tell you how much volume and what the stock closed at. I said, oh, I like that very much. <laughs> I go back to when I started. We didn't have these quote machines. Yeah. If you wanted to know the price of a stock, you'd pick up the phone, you'd call somebody on the floor of the exchange, they would run out to the crowd where the trade was in that stock, tell you the last sale, run back, give it to you, you'd call up the customer and tell them. Typically by the time... You told them the number. It had changed. That was it. It was manual. Yeah. And so I started doing this every day. And at the end of the month, I said, Marion, we keep records here. How would you like a summary at the end of the month by the day, the price of the stock, it opened, what it opened every day, and what it closed out, and what the volume was? She said, oh, thank you very much. Okay. About, I'm doing this for about a year, making nothing. About a year later, our boss calls me up, who was a very reserved, uh, one, he became a good friend of mine, wonderful man, but very reserved. And he called me up and he said, um, we decided we want to start buying our stock in. We'd like you to buy 3,000 shares of Kroger stock every day you can't be in the market for the first 30 minutes, and you got to be out the last, that's the SEC rule, you got to be out the last 30 minutes. You can't bid the stock up. In other words, you could go, you can buy it at what the bid price is, but I can't, in other words, so they couldn't influence the stock going up. And back then, let's say Kroger was selling for $40 a share, the commission would be $40 for 100 shares of stock. So if I got 3,000 shares a day, it was $1,200 a day, do the math, times five is $6,000, times 52 weeks is $300,000. And if I'm getting paid a third, I made 100 grand just on that one account. So, so it's so interesting because there's a lot of stories in the book like this where you either are willing to take no fee unless you take a success fee. You focus on success. Yeah, I don't. I, I, well, don't. I never wanted to take cash fees. I always wanted to take stocks in the company. So, so, so it seems like the power of free is is also a key to success. Or, or how? What's a different way you would phrase it? Maybe, maybe again, focusing the on the willingness. The willingness to show that you believe in what you're doing mm-hmm. and put your money where your mouth is. See, so the other part of the Perot deal was well, he called me one day before the deal was done, and he said, you guys on Wall Street are saying 
you're taking advantage of a hot market. In 68, the market was good. And I said, okay. I said, so they think that I'm just opportunistic. And he said, right. I said, all right. I said, how about if I buy 5,000 shares of stock at the price we charge on the public? And he's quick. He said, well, you could sell it for a profit if it goes up. I said, okay, but I can't sell it for three years. So he said to me, what do you mean? I said, well, if you go to do the stock at $16, $15 a share, that's 75 grand. And um, I'll hold it for three years. Now, here's the math. We did, we did, uh, we did, 600,000, I think it was 600,000 shares of stock. No, yeah, I think we did 600,000 shares. The offering was 600,000 shares. And the spread, let's say $15.90 a share. The commission was about, the total underwriting spread was 300 grand. And by the time you paid the other underwriters, you had made maybe 75 or 100 grand. So I was willing to put up Personally, I was going to, here's what happened. I was going to buy it for the firm. And I, when Perot said, okay, I'll do that, I went to the firm. And the firm said, oh, no, we don't want to do it. And I said, okay. And I felt honor bound. I'll do it myself. I didn't know where the hell I was going to get 75 grand from. But I made the offer, and I was not going to back away from it. The guy, Rudy Smutney, when he heard I had done that, said, well, I'd like to ask him if he'll do 5,000 shares with me. And I went back to Ross, and Ross said, no, I don't want to do any more than that. I said, well, I'll tell you what, Ross. I'm going to give half to Rudy. So he'll have $2,500, I'll have $2,500. And Perot said, well, if you're going to do that, I'll give you another 500 each. So you got each got 3000 So each of us bought 3,000 shares at sixteen fifty a share. And I held that stock for years. Hmm. So I, I, think, I think people are more comfortable when your economic interests are in complete alignment. And again, it's it's a kind of skin in the game. Yeah. Where you're yeah. you're 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 being paid based almost on your on the size of your well, faith. We found at Home Depot. I could have been a I I'm a partner, I'm a I'm a co owner, co manager, I'm a co founder. I'll take five percent of the company and you guys have got they ended up having fifty and the they had to have forty five and the investors got fifty percent. And by the way, not only did I take the five percent as a co-founder, but I put a hundred grand into the deal itself. Right. Of the two million bucks we raised, I put a hundred thousand up. So, so it's interesting. There's a lot of stories like that where, I mean, even in that story, Arthur says to you, "Where we, you know, you walk out of Ross Perot's office with a, saying no to him, and, and he was going to get seventy percent, right? And and Arthur says, "Where are we going to get the money?" And you're like, "Don't worry, we're going to get it." And it seems like. There's a lot of stories where everyone's saying to you, Ken, where are we going to get the money? And you're like, don't, don't worry. You had an enormous faith that... You heard the story about the rabbi? No. Rabbi's daughter's getting married, and she's marrying... I'm sorry, a, a businessman's daughter's marrying a young rabbi. And so the wife says, Sadie says to the businessman, her husband, Jake, she says, Jake, she says, our daughter's marrying a rabbi. Our daughter has lived so well clothes, vacations. He, she says, how can this poor man provide for her the way she, we've raised her? He's, I'll talk to him, I'll talk to him. So uh, he goes in and he sees the kid. He's just down there and Rabbi, he says, look, you marry my daughter. She goes, her mother and she go to Paris for the finest fashions and she goes to all these five-star restaurants with us and we have drivers and so forth and so he's, what about this? And the guy's, well, God will provide. And then so the next thing he says is, well, what about the couture in Paris? God will provide. And the five-star guy, he's okay. So he walks out in the room. The wife says, how did it go? He says, it was great. He thinks I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's a cute story. So, well, c clearly the guy has to hustle by asking the father. You know, well, the father uh, hold it. Uh it's 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 going to be hard for your listeners to say this guy's not full of shit. It should never be about the money. It should always be about the accomplishment. Okay? Yeah, I I think I, that's key. I, I love being rich. But I'd much prefer to be remembered that I kept my word. 
I put my money where my mouth was, and I behaved like a gentleman when I lost. And I don't think that's separate from being rich. No. <laughs> I think if no. you didn't have those qualities. Hey, look, like the kid says to me one time, money doesn't buy happiness. I said, give poverty a shot. See how good it does. So, so let's let's the the book's titled "I Love Capitalism." I want to talk about and 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 you know you you allude to kind of the nuances of capitalism in mm. that last anecdote, mm. and I'm curious just about a couple of things. The main the main discussion happening in the world right now is that you know I'll I'll, I'll back it up. When cars replaced horses, mm -hmm. everybody who worked in the horse industry started working in the car industry. Right. But now with AI and robots or whatever replacing, you know, the guys, you know, stuffing the shelves at Walmart or whatever, are there going to be, is there going to be a void in jobs? Uh, I, I tend to think in general, I have sort of a big faith in innovation, but I, I don't really know the well, mathematical answer to this question. The answer is to me simple. I think the opportunities for everybody to be elevated by technology are profound. The question is, and this comes back to my other passion, we better realize we've got a serious crisis in public education in America. Home Depot is not going to be able to hire somebody who can't read directions on a box to help a customer figure out what they want to do. We are, I think our public education system today in America is a disgrace. We spend more money, per, take the 30 most developed countries on earth, we spend more money per student than any of those 30 countries. And we rank 28th out of 30th in results. If there's 80, there's, there's eight, I'm sorry, there's, a, there's 100,000 jobs in New York City right now crying for somebody to fill them with a starting pay of $80,000 a year. They're technicians, they're, you know, opportunities abound, but, but people need to be prepared to seize those moments. We're doing a horrible job in public education. Do you think that's fixable? Because to take any government, it tends to wrap itself in more and more bureaucracy. Like it's, it's very rare where the United States in its history has reduced bureaucracy. And that's what kind of causes the, the problems. Let me, let, me, let me say this to you. <clears throat> Anybody who lives in this city of any kind of financial consequence doesn't send their children to public schools in New York City. Who goes to public schools in New York City? Minorities, poor people, people that can't afford, even to send them to a Catholic school or, or yeshiva or whatever. And this is political, and I pray to God I don't mean it that. Obama would have gone down in history as the finest president in America ever. If when he started out in 2009, to say, I'm going, I want you to measure me by how much I improve public education in America. Mm. That's all I want you to measure me by. I'm going to be maniacal. I'd have called Arnie Duncan in and said, Arnie, you and I, you're gonna be my secretary of education. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna let the chips fall where they may. We're gonna be agnostic. We're we're not gonna be in the least bit interested in blame. We're gonna simply look at the system and say, this is wrong and we gotta fix it, and this is right, we gotta strengthen it, and this we don't need, and this is what we don't have that we do need, and we're gonna be absolutely objective. And when I'm done as president, I want to be able to have people say, this is where he started in public education, and this is where he ended. He blew it. He blew it. What, would, you, what would be the first two things you would do if you were Secretary of Education? I'd call the teachers' unions in and say, game's up. You're going to start doing a better job teaching these kids, or I'm going to go back to the American people and tell them it's the biggest ripoff in history. Now, there's where the politics comes in, because teachers' unions are among the most prolific supporters of politics. You take a teacher's union at 80 bucks a month dues, that's a lot of juice. But how would they improve? Well, I would first of all say to the teachers, we're gonna make sure you're qualified. We're gonna make sure that what you're trying to teach the kids, you know. This is not nice what I'm saying, and I'm sure there's gonna be a million teachers out there hating my guts, but I'm sorry. I look back at my public school education, and I, I fought hard not 
not to get an education. But I think about what was the differentiator for me in my life, and that was those wonderfully passionate, dedicated teachers who really made sure they were going to do everything they could to shove down my throat knowledge. And God damn it, it worked. Now, I hear again and again and again, well, these poor kids, they don't have family structures like we used to. And I said, hold it. All you're doing is arguing my point that because those kids don't have that, you have to do more. We can't punish the kid for that. We've got to say, okay, I'm not going to let a kid starve. If I know a parents aren't feeding a kid, I'm going to say, well, just the fact that they're not feeding them, if I don't feed the kid, he's going to starve. I'm going to give the kid the food to live. So, so, so let's play this out, though. Mm. Assuming public education doesn't improve and assuming, you know, robots take more and more Home Depot jobs, what's going to happen? Well, let me, let, let's take it more live. I, by the way, there's a current series of ads. Um, I love the tagline. It's America's first jobs. I don't know if you saw the ads. No. Very subtle. America's first jobs, meaning you go to work for McDonald's, you're not going to end up at McDonald's the rest of your life. That's that's a nice segue into work. We've got to be careful. Look, the other thing I worry about is income inequality. Look at Cuba, look at Venezuela, look at Russia, look at all the countries where you have social upheaval. It's when the people at the lower end of the spectrum give up. They say, there's nothing in this for me. So a Castro shows up or a uh, the guy from uh, Chavez from Venezuela, and he'll say, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. And they say, you know what, give him a shot. We've got to do something about income inequality. That said, I understand, don't motivate uh, Steve Easterbrook. He runs McDonald's, and he's done a hell of a job, by the way. Don't motivate him and his people to say, we can't afford to pay $16, $17 an hour or $15 an hour. So the next thing you do, you go into a McDonald's and there's an electronic device. Like, remember the old automats? Yeah. You put a nick, put a quarter, and put a dime and get a piece of pie out. It was right there. Don't, don't put McDonald's in a position where you motivate them to do away with the front end. Where what you're going to have is you walk in and, and it's going to be the same product. It's going to be the same heat, same, you know, warmth. One thing about McDonald's is this. I know when I go to a McDonald's restaurant, I know exactly what I'm going to get. And I'm never disappointed. That's good. Now, you could argue that if I go to Shake Shack, I'll get a better hamburger, or I go to, go to uh, Smash Burger or whatever the hell these other five guys. That may well be. But I know there's a consistency to what McDonald's is going to sell me. That's why I go in there. And as long as it's not less than that, I'm happy. But don't put McDonald's or anybody else in a position where you motivate them. You incentivize them to do away with entry level because then you're going to be in trouble. And we've got to educate these kids. We've got to help these kids. Look, I feel terrible for these kids. They're being cheated. Kids graduating with high school diplomas and they can't read fifth grade. But I wonder, it feels to me, and, I, and I'm... I have no idea what I'm talking about, but it, it it feels like things don't change positively when uh, you're relying on a, 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 an overly complicated bureaucracy that, you know, lots of things has to happen in order for a significant change to occur. Look, as between, if there are things that business can do, or the private sector can do, that the government's doing, the chances are business will do it better. Good example of VA. I think if you privatized the VA with with all of the capitalistic motives that go with that, I think the quality and the cost would drop, cost would drop dramatically and the quality would go through the roof. Give us give a businessman a challenge with an opportunity to succeed, profit. That's a horrible word, but to make a profit, he'll figure it out. Look at what Look at what Bezos does. I, I think Facebook, you don't pay anything to get Facebook, right? Because advertisers pay for it. Right. But so, when you buy a magazine, you got to pay for the magazine, and they're still selling ads. Do you think businesses will kind of rise to the challenge of taking on public education? 
If they're given certainly the there's a lot of private education. If they're given the incentives, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Look, I think there's going to be a, one of the great revolutions coming is going to be a, a higher education. Jack Welch's uh, business school he started, which is part of Australia University, you got to be you have to have a job while you're going to his, his thing where you can't enroll, and it's online. So you got the benefit of the greatest professors in the world, and technology is allowing you today. I think about how much I've learned from the professor, but if I have access to the professor, but better than that, I've got a there's a system in existence. I marvel. I sit here with my iPad. I got the whole library all over the world in my lap. I used to have to go to the New York Public Library on Saturday afternoons when I was working on my thesis for my MBA. I got to do it on my home now. I used to have to go to the office to find out about numbers or a corporate or who was on the board of the court. It's right here. Something that thin and Christ. It's all here. Technology's making it easier to get these things done. And we will get them done. But God damn it, turn us loose. Let us do what we do best. And if in the process of helping everybody else, we make money, so what? Home Depot, you go around America today, we know we're selling products to people at a much lower price than they're going to buy at a mom and pop hardware store. And by the way, we're there. If you don't like it, bring it back. I mean, it works. And so guess what? Bernie Arthur and I, Pat Farah, the whole original investors, we made a lot of money. But look at the people we brought to the party. Here's capitalism. We have 400,000 associates at Depot today. We have 3,000 people working for the company today. 3,000. We started out pushing carts in from the parking lot out of high school, 18 years old. That are multi-millionaires. Capitalism works. God damn it, it works, and it works well. And then you figure there's the multiplier effect. They're all going to buy houses. Yeah, and well, no, the system works. Companies. I don't want to use trickle down because that's been beaten up politically. But a guy working for me now gets a promotion. All of a sudden, he's taking his wife out, not to McDonald's. He's going to uh, Applebee's or the next level up. He's spending money. He's buying a house. He, one of my great joys in life when I had the brokerage firm was I used to love when my salesmen had wives that were spendthrifts. Because okay. these guys would have to work their asses off that much harder to satisfy their wife's spending habits. It's okay. That's how it works. So, and it works for everybody. So you talk in the book about how your motivation was seeing a Bernie Sanders rally and all these young people. Scared the hell out of me. Why? What's, what's his appeal? And what are people not seeing about capitalism? I think he's a phony. What's his appeal? He's a loser. What the hell did Bernie... Look, I'll give him credit for one thing. He got elected to the Senate. Okay? That's, so what? Guess what? What did he do in his life before that? He was a flop. He wasn't a, he wasn't a great doctor or a great lawyer. By the way, I'll tell you what. I'm going to blow people's minds. There is an enormous plus, huge plus, in Donald Trump becoming president of the United States. What is it? I can think of people, Jamie Dimon, Mike Bloomberg, um, Howard, Schultz. Howard Schultz. Oh, the door is open to them. We, up until Trump, we sort of had, we have a, we have a class system in politics Andrew Cuomo, Mario Cuomo's son. This Kennedy that's in Congress now, grandson of Bobby Kennedy, brother of the president, we were creating dynasties. Yeah. I think it, the more people we can encourage to give politics a shot, the better the chance we have of getting the right people to do the right things. So I think Trump, to me, if I was a guy aspiring, I'd say, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. He did it. Who the, I mean, 7 o'clock election night, they, I, unless you were drunk or insane, you didn't think Trump had a goddamn chance of winning the election. Yeah, right. No, no, no 7 o'clock that night. No station was predicting no, that. No, no. Four hours later, boy, all these media people were dying. Yeah. It was, one was crying. Martha, what the hell is it, a radish? She was crying. 
Yeah. Look, look. The more people we can motivate to enter politics or political service or public service, we're a better nation. I think Trump's Trump's election, Trump's victory, is going to help people to reach that conclusion that they might not have otherwise done. How much more? I got. I got. You know, I'm, I'm yeah, still working for a goddamn living. I mean, you know, you guys. Well, well, okay. So I want to close with. You have a quote here that I think is great. You want my whole philosophy in a nutshell? I want everybody to do well. The world is a lot more fun. If we're if we're all rich instead of just some of us, I agree with that. Look, uh, my driver Alvaro, I, and I talk in the book about his apartment. I love it. I love the when Alvaro brought Elaine and me to show me his apartment on the 16th floor of this high rise on Singer Island. I felt better than if I owned it and lived there. It worked. Go outside and look at how Alvaro's dressed today, and he takes his wife to nice restaurants. Okay, and Pam Goldman. I I want people to do well. I want look. I don't want to create a class system because if you do me, fifty years ago, I'd have been on the outs. Right. Thank God the system was open for me. Well, I think in in your book and through your through the stories in the book, we see your philosophies on life, business, hard work honesty, both in your personal relationships, your professional relationships, your, your charitable relationships. Uh, I think I Love Capitalism should be read by anybody in, oh, that's very in, nice in, you. in business, in entrepreneurship, in innovation, in technology. There's so many lessons here about the economy and, and, and success and wealth and hard work. Uh, it's, just, it's just a great book by you know, you, Ken Langone, co-founder of Home Depot, a place I must admit I have never shopped. You I, have I, it. I, I, I don't know a shower a faucet pox from, on a, your house. from a bathroom <laughs> faucet. <laughs> so, a pox on your house. May all your faucets leak. No, because here's the thing. I would hire. May all, may all your windows have drafts. I would hire a contractor to do it for me. I no, want but the contractor to do it. If you're well. enlightened, you would say to the contractor, you're going to buy everything at Home Depot, you're going to use on my house. I, I, I have faith they will do the best no, thing. No, well, no, no, but you uh, look. Every once in a while, people need leadership, okay? <laughs> you exercise your leadership. All right, that's a good tell point. Them, okay? <laughs> anyway, Done. Th thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you and so by much, the way, Ken. Thanks for your kind words. And all I can tell people, we live in the greatest country on earth. Nothing would, this would not have happened to me except I was blessed to be born in America. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Well, and I agree with you. And again, I hope everyone listening reads the book and, and sees all your amazing stories. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.